Hey guys, all right. So this is for you curious uh, that don't know about you know Mexican cartels and how it is out here with life and whatnot. This article kind of spreads some truth and spreads some uh, knowledge about what goes on over here, cartels, uh, in the civilians, you know, crime. We're gonna we're gonna read all this, all right? Sit tight, grab some popcorn. The U.S. is fascinated by Mexican cartel bosses. The truth is less entertaining. All right, so we're gonna skip right. Oh, you know what, you guys? You guys read that growing up in Sinaloa? All right, so you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, keep going. Yeah, that right there is basically like a saint. Right, let me let me read it right here. It's in English. Candles at the chapel dedicated to Jesus Malverde, patron saint of narcos in Culiacan, Mexico. So, narcs, uh, cartels in general, they worship him because they feel as if this guy brings them luck, and prosperity in their line of duty uh we could go i could i could share another video about the story of malverde but right now is not the time in july 2014 mira medina quinones was looking for her son like hundreds of others in the state of sinaloa mexico he had recently gone missing with few to no clues left regarding his whereabouts or safety after being told by police authorities of the el fuerte municipality that they did not conduct searches for missing people Medina Quinones decided to take matters into her own hands, beginning a pursuit that would eventually be joined by hundreds of other mothers of the region whose own children have suddenly vanished. The word desaparecido in Spanish has an extra translation, disappeared, though in English the word is used as a verb. For Mexicans, desaparecido is very much a noun. Employed in countless headlines and everyday conversations, los desaparecidos, the disappeared, describes the men and women who simply go missing, de un día para otro, from one day to the next. In a country that for many decades has been the epicenter of drug trafficking, the main route for illegal substances passing through the other way to the United States, on their way to the United States. Medina Quinone has found the remains of her son, Roberto Corrales, three years after she began her tireless search, which by then had transformed into something much larger, larger than one mother's solitary grief. The woman who had joined her years earlier to search for their own disappeared family members formed a group going by the name Las Rastreadores del Fuerte. In the face of local authorities' indifferences, Indifference, they armed themselves with shovels and ice picks and began scouting the Sinaloa Mountains for clandestine burial pits in the hopes of identifying the discovered human remains as one of their own. That's pretty sad. It's almost too eerie to be real, isn't it? An army of grieving mothers trekking through fields searching only for corpses because seeking any semblance of justice would be too unrealistic in ambition. So they believe that once they're disappeared, it's a wrap. They don't, they don't try to look for them alive. Instead, they look for their corpses. That is what that last paragraph said right there. That it is too unrealistic to find a living, disappeared person. It is almost as rare as finding a diamond. Here we can see uh, Mira Medina Quinones with other members of the Rastreadores in El Fuerte at the site where they found her son's remains. That's sad. I've been haunted by the thought of these women for months now. I can't get them out of my head. When I was growing up in Sinaloa, in a city called Culiacan, I would often think of the phrase, reality is stranger than fiction. The city, which is also the capital of the state, is widely known for being the cradle of narco culture, a place where the operations of drug cartels are deeply entrenched in the local folklore. It's not that everyone there is involved in the illicit activities of drug trafficking. It's just that everyone is aware of them, and many people take pride in their close proximity. It's something like what I used to do, and that's not of this paragraph. It's something like what I used to do. You know I mean, like I know a lot of people, and you know what? I used to take pride in, like, oh yeah, I know this guy. Like nowadays, it's just like, damn, we grow up and we mature, and we start thinking in reality. You know what I mean? I, I guess it's just a family or wife sometimes that changes the head. Continue with the story. Don't, and this is what my dad even told me when I got here. Don't honk your horn at anyone. My dad instructed me when I was learning how to drive. You never know who could be in the, others, um, in the other car. And that is so true here in Mexicali. You really can't know who is at the other side of the other car driving. It could be a cartel boss. It could be an underling. It could be a pawn. And that pawn can have his way of justice, 
against you. You you might as well tell me, King, how, how, what do you mean justice if he, if he's committing a crime? Yeah, I know, but that's how it is right here. It's basically if you throw if you um if you're walking and you bump into someone, they think it's justice for them to you know say something back or say something about it. You know what I mean? Like it's their underground justice right here. It's their respect. Their respect. There you go. Corrido, songs dedicated to well-known drug lords exalting their conquest and exploits blare from trucks with dark tinted windows as they take as they make their way through the streets. Waves of violence come and go, but the feeling of impending danger is perpetual. Don't honk your horn at anyone, my dad instructed me when I was learning how to drive. You never know who could be in the other car. My deep belief that the quotidian, if quotidian, quotidian sorry, events of my life were far more bizarre than what any fictionalized version of them could portray was the main reason I never watched any movies or shows focused on drug cartels. Not Sicario, not Savages, not La Reina del Sur. Which, by the way, Sicario is a, a freaking great movie. I don't care what this article has to say. <laughs> I was immune to their shock value, not far enough removed from the consequences of the reality they depicted to be entertained. Even after I moved to Guadalajara for college in 2010 and later Mexico City, I was supposed I was also not involved enough in the culture to feel represented or validated or seen. At best, I felt disinterested. At worst, angry at the glorifying lens through which the world was acquainting itself with the cartels that ruled my city. So, in in uh, in, a, in a normal in normal words, it's basically saying that uh, she was he she was mad that everyone glorifies these cartel members. Everyone like it, it's it's pretty it pretty it sucks honestly that instead of trying to do a, a be a good person in society, most people admire and like what they see when they see these cartel members or these freaking sicarios with their nice cars and everything. Like obviously, you know what I mean, but that's how it is in Mexico. I'm not alone in rejecting these idolized de depictions. They're commercializing tra tragedy, sorry. And it's not historic, said Carlos, a man I spoke to whose brother was abducted years ago, a few miles outside of Culiacan. I've changed his name at his request. It's still unfolding here every day, and these shows don't signal the social problems. They create idols. What's most curious, he says, is that the stories told are usually from the perspective of criminals or authorities. No one else's. This is an image from Narcos, the Netflix. Diego Luna, he fuck, dude. This guy Diego Luna does a pretty good job in that freaking show. Um, Angel Felix Gallardo, the one who started it all, the golden, the golden narco, as we call him here in, in Mexico, el, el narco de oro. Last November, after three successful seasons of his of hits, hit of hits hit seasons. Narcos, sorry. <laughs> Netflix rolled out a fourth installment of the show, this time set in 1980s Mexico. And sure enough, the story begins in Sinaloa, on the outskirts of Culiacán. It's most surreal to be to this small world I grew up in. The thick Sinaloa accent, the coexistence of rural poverty and exorbitant wealth, the casual com commodification of women, the corruption of law and order, now front and center for the rest of the world to consume as entertainment, which that's pretty sad, but it is what it is. And for the first time, I decided to watch in an attempt, as morbid as this will sound, to alleviate a particularly strong pang of homesicknesses, homesickness, sorry. But whatever I was hoping to find, it wasn't there. Despite a majority Latino cast and a hefty amount of Spanish, I would say Narcos Mexico is a show that I, like its predecessors, it's built to deliver exactly what U.S. audiences want to see when they peek into the illicit world of drug trafficking. And that's that's honestly pretty true. When I seen it, I was like, wow. But there's some parts that are not mentioned in, in, the, in the history of the, of the episodes, which, you know, I'll talk later on in, in my Kraken's World reviews and stuff like that. It is a story that it is essentially about both an underdog and a visionary, a business savvy man in a suit who hoodwinks the government until he has to bribe the government, amassing a fortune and a submissive respect of his peers along the way. Recent decades have seen the rise of arbitrary abductions and, and killings in the regions of Mexico that host the country's leading cartel headquarters. Much of the violence is a nonsensical as it is brutal, and yet the myths of the benevolent drug lord persist beyond Mexico's border. It's a neat narrative to produce and consume, and America, it seems, loves neat narratives. Narcos Mexico tells the story of how decades ago Miguel Angel Feliz Gallardo, played by Diego Luna, managed to go from lowly petty police officer of the then underdeveloped state of Sinaloa to the country's most powerful drug kingpin as he was rising to power along with his associates Rafael Caro Quintero and Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo. The American Drug Enforcement Administration agent Enrique Quique Camarera 
worked undercover to foil their operation. The season ends with Camarera's brutal abduction, torture, and murder at the hands of the cartel. A true event that prompted what is still one of the largest homicide investigations ever conducted by the U.S. government in North America. I also want to add that there is another movie that involves this, uh, Kike Camarera, and it's called Miss Bala. You guys should go check it out. You check it on YouTube. Check the preview. It's a great movie. This was this was years ago. This movie, but it is based on Kike Camarera's death. Uh, Mexico's social fabric is framed. This is the sort of truth that gets lost in shows such as Narcos. Luna, for all his acting chops as the show's main capo, does a noteworthy job fucking up the Sinaloa accent, but by far the most irritating voice in the show is the distinctly American narrator's Scoot McNary, cutting an opportunity into the plot. The narrator has been a decisive fixture of Narcos since the beginning. His profanity-ridden monologue serves as a constant reminder that the story being told is, above all, supposed to be entertaining. I mean, I get it. It's a show. And shows are made to entertain. Decades of successful mafia movies have proven that the subject rarely fails to entice audiences who live in no reality, who, who, real, sorry, who live in no real proximity to violence. Exactly. The, suburb, the suburban dad who loves the godfather, the white dude with a Scarface poster tacked to his dorm room wall, the though Narcos Mexico, which has already been renewed for a second season, is based on true events, its delivery is stale, stale, stale formulaic. I don't, I don't know how to say it. Formulaic? Oh, fuck it. And it seems wholly uninterested in exploring anything beyond the tired tropes of the genre. Last September, the news of an 18-wheeler truck near Guadalajara carrying nearly 200 corpses stunned the country. And this is a real story right here. This is real. It was confirmed that local authorities facing no space in the morgue for new arrivals had ordered the bodies to be dumped in the trailer and driven aimlessly through the city's periphery. Octavio Cotero, then director of the Forensic Science Institute of Jalisco, claim that there are at least 20 other states battling similar storage problems. The country has 32 states. Mexico's social fabric is fraying. This is the sort of truth that gets lost in the shows as narcos. Reality is stranger than fiction. It is also certainly and indefinitely more complex. So these are here admirers of Chapo because, you know, Chapo used to help uh, his city, but at the same time he caused war for them. But yeah, let's just continue with the story article lately i've been feeling strangely protective of mexico i try to explain the nuisance of this surreal country to every foreigner i encounter it with an urgency that surely comes across as unwarranted no it's not like what you think at all it's not as bad but also it's so much worse what i'm trying to say why does it feel so imperative the harrowing violence that takes place in mexico isn't exactly lacking coverage in u.s media oh i just want to say that one more time the, har the harrowing violence that takes place in Mexico isn't exactly lacking coverage in U.S. media. The United States sitting president basically launched his campaign off of it. What's curious to me is how the violence can simultaneously co uh, occupy two opposing narratives. One is a phantom threat of Mexicans as rapists, murders, and monsters messily flowing into the U.S. bringing drugs, bringing crime. At the same time, the man in a suit. His flair for business, the justified murders, the, co the complicit governments. In Narcos Mexico, Felix Gallardo, whose nickname was El Padrino, the Godfather, is shown to be an elegant and calculating executive. He protests Cam Camarera's abduction, which is Kike Camarera, the, the, the agent that was uh, you know, abducted, and giving the order for his murder seems to weigh on his conscience. It plays well into the narrative that has been crafted by American media about mafia characters, men who don't mess with anyone who doesn't mess with them. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's trial began last November in Brooklyn around the same time that Narcos Mexico premiered. The, the alleged former leader of the Sinaloa cartel has escaped from Mexican prisons twice and was extradited to the United States in 2016 following his third arrest. He is revered at, or at least obsessed over on both sides of the border. In Sinaloa, Chapo merch abounds, abounds and a march held in the state's capital demanding his release after his apprehension in 2014 was attended by thousands. In the U.S., his trial was become, has become something of a tourist attraction, drawing crowds of people to gather outside the courthouse, eagerly waiting a glimpse of the defendant all five feet, six inches of him. Excuse me. <laughs> a friend who recently visited New York told me there are cartoonists in Times Square quickly drawing El Chapo's portrait and offering it to amused passersby. 
Vice has produced eight episodes of a podcast in English and Spanish covering his trial, which you can listen to on Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube. Its host, Keegan Hamilton, has been live tweeting the proceedings with an enthusiasm that conveys his deep fascination with not just uh, not just this case, but cartel operations in general. There's something about the language he uses that reminds me of the wide-eyed expressions of excitement in many American f friends' faces when I tell them about my hometown. Sometimes I feel the media has overexposed him. Emma Coronel Aispuro, Guzman's wife, told Telemundo recently, I feel people created an image of him and they, and they want that image to remain in the public's conscience. It's the image that sells. And that's true. I've been surrounded by the mythology of drug lords all my life. The truth is, it is fascinating. I wouldn't be writing this if it weren't. It's worth remembering though the... <laughs> He's so right. It's worth remembering though that the legend is still fiction. There is no glamour to murder, no glory in gore, the trafficking systems are less sophisticated than one would imagine, the brains behind the operations less sharp and calculating. For every philanthropic deed by the cartel in a rural town, there are countless people abducted and murdered. Actually, there are not countless, there is an exact number of them, and every day it grows. There are the children of women sweep, weeping in fields, the afterthought in shows like narcos. I looked, I looked online for hours, but I never did find a photograph of Joaquin Guzman in a suit. So that was it, guys. I hope you guys liked that one. That was a pretty good article. I mean, very entertaining. And everything it says in here, it's, it's pretty spot on. It is pretty spot on. But, of course, I can add more things, but we've, we're almost reaching uh, 20 minutes, and I don't like keeping you guys waiting. I don't like keeping you guys um, with a long video. Some of you guys don't have long attention span. Let's face it. <laughs> I've seen the analytics. Most of you guys just watch about six minutes <laughs> and then just get tired. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. That's, you know, it's okay. It's okay. That's why I always like to keep my, um, my videos short, basic, intriguing, informatic, and truthful. Everything I say... It's either based on articles, and if those articles come out false, I'm deleting the video, just like I did with uh, Rafael Moreno del Valle, the governor, the ex-governor of, uh, of, you know, the one that the helicopter crashed and, and his wife, too. That's why I deleted that one, because there was supposedly a video where uh, they showed him getting off the, the helicopter, and I thought, oh, look, he re it's, it's, it's true, you know, he, he's, still, he's still alive. But no, it was fake. It was from, like, a long time ago, and I deleted the video right away because I don't want nothing fake on my channel. Everything has to be real. Catch you guys later.